Amen. This morning's talk is entitled Cup. Cup. How many of you drink from a cup? We all drink from a cup and cups are very important. And uh, if we're ever feeling thirsty, we need to have a drink. Like after this service, we're going to have a cup of coffee or tea or something together. And uh, it's really, really important. But there's this scripture in the Bible, and it's this amazing scripture, and it's found in John chapter 4, verses 4 to 26. And uh, in this scripture, Jesus uses a drink of water to bring a revival to an entire village. And uh, so please turn to John chapter 4, verses 4 to 26, and it reads like this. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asks you for a drink... You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will no longer worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews." Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, well, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. This is such an awesome passage of scripture, and it's awesome for many, many reasons. The first reason it's awesome, it's one of the few times you actually see Jesus preaching to a non-Jew. I mean, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is going from place to place, town to town, speaking to Jewish people in their synagogues from the Torah or from the Old Testament and proving to them that the kingdom of God and that the Messiah is coming. We see Jesus preaching to Jews. But on a few rare glimpses of occasions, we see Jesus preaching or speaking to non-Jews. And that's really important to us because we live in a predominantly non-Jewish society, right? So if we want to know how to share the faith with non-Jews, with Gentiles, then we kind of need to look at the master and say, well, how did the master do it? That's why, number one, this, this is just such an awesome scripture. The second reason it's awesome is because when Jesus is preaching amongst Jewish people, He never tells them outright he's the Messiah. He's always quite secret about it. The miracles I do speak for me. What do the prophets say? What did Moses say? What time was the Messiah Messiah supposed to arrive? Where was the uh, Messiah supposed to come from? And so Jesus, when he's speaking to Jewish people, he's quite shrouded. He's quite cloaked in in the way he deals with them. But when he comes to speak with this Samaritan woman, he says, oh, you're talking about the Messiah. Yeah, me. I'm the Messiah. The one who speaks to you right now, I'm the Messiah. He just comes out and shares it with her because she's not a Jew. He talks about eternal life. He talks about the Holy Spirit. He uses words of knowledge, supernatural power. 
I love this scripture, it's so awesome. And if you knew the historical background behind this, it's even more awesome. You see, the northern kingdom of Israel was attacked by the Assyrians and all the Jews were taken away to Assyria. And in their place, the Assyrians put all of the, uh, the captives from other nations and put them in the northern kingdom of Israel. So the northern kingdom of Israel was no longer Jewish. It was a mixture of pagan peoples who came back to the land. And then they kind of worshipped their own pagan gods and goddesses. But they also included Yahweh in the worship of the pagan gods and goddesses. So the people that Jesus is speaking to here are not Jews they're the ancestors of those pagans that came back into the country, established by the Assyrians, and they have this kind of weird mixture of faith, partly to do with Yahweh, but partly to do with these other uh, superstitions and traditions and pagan religious systems. And what's amazing about this is that Jewish people, they try to steer clear of Samaritans. I mean, they hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. In fact, the only time Jewish people were allowed to walk through Samaria is if they were traveling northwards from Jerusalem because the Samaritans wanted the Jews to see their temple to their God. And so they permitted you to walk northwards. But if you tried as a Jewish man or woman to walk southward from the Galilee through Samaria to go to Jerusalem, they could kill you for it. In fact, it's recorded that certain Jewish people were killed by the Samaritans for trying to go through Jerusalem and using Samaria as a shortcut. That's how much the Samaritans hated the Jews and how much the Jews hated the Samaritans. Never the twain shall meet. But Jesus said, needs must I go through Samaria. So Jesus goes through this real hostile place and there's this Samaritan woman not a bloke. I mean, for a, a Jewish man to speak to a, Jew, a Samaritan man, that's one thing. For a Jewish man to speak to a Samaritan woman is just the height of just, it's just unacceptable behavior. How many of you are hearing me right now? You just do not do that. And Jesus isn't even playing it safe. He hasn't even got his disciples with him. He's told them to go off and buy food. So he's all by himself, a single Jewish man with a single Jewish woman, and he strikes up a conversation with her. Now, I hope through this you can see the heart of God, just how much God loves people. Amen. Jesus was sent to the house of Israel to save them. But here is this Samaritan woman and, and the father is speaking to Jesus and says, right, go to Samaria, sit down at this well and preach to her. So Jesus sits down and says, I'm really thirsty. Mm. Could I have a cup of that nice cold water that you're drawing out? This is Gaia's cup, by the way. My cup was like some kind of cheapy cup from Tesco's. But when I saw this and it had the name Beast on it, probably named after her father, um, I had to use this cup. It's just such a lovely cup. She told me not to drink anything from it. Gaia, I can't. You've gobbled a lot. Um, but Jesus said, give me a drink of cold water. He was hot, sweaty. Give me a drink of cold water. She's like, how can you speak to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Don't you understand that Jews and Samaritans are not supposed to speak? He says, well, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you'd have actually asked him for some water. And he wouldn't have given you water from Jacob's well. He'd have given you living water, flowing water. And this isn't any normal type of water. This is supernatural water that when you drink of this flowing living water, it wells up within you to eternal life. The water I'll give you will give you eternal life. And she's like, sir, starts off by calling him, sir, where can I get this water? I wanna ask you a question. Imagine the leisure center is hired and two speakers are going to be there. The first speaker is a healing speaker, somebody that has the gifts of healing. Every person upon whom he lays his hands gets healed. And he's had a success rate of 100%, and he's healed a minimum of 10,000 people. Every single time he lays hands upon them, they're healed. Whatever the disease, whatever the illness, he hires Gloucester Leisure Center and starts publicizing it that a healing minister is coming. Number one, the second minister is somebody that's led 
five people to Christ in his lifetime. He's led five people to Christ and he's going to hire the leisure center. And he's going to stand up and preach the gospel. And he's going to share testimony as how he led those five people to Jesus. Which minister is going to get the crowd? The one that's healed 10,000 people, right? But can you imagine the angels in heaven when they hear that there's this healing minister on earth and everybody upon whom he lays his hands, they get healed of sickness? And another report comes from, hey, Michael, Gabriel, guess what, guess what? Oh, John down there, John, John the healing minister, he's just healed another one. Can you imagine the angel's response? Whatever. Another sick person healed. It's good. Power of God's moving, but it's okay. Now imagine the same angel coming before Gabriel and Michael and saying, Gabriel, Michael, you, you, you know Steve? The evangelist, the, the, the one that preaches the gospel. He's seen five people saved. Well, at the service at the ledge center, one more person came to Jesus. Guess how the angels are going to respond? Woo! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Can you see how on earth we get things back to front? We get things all messed up. Now, it's, if he could do both, if he could heal the sick and then get them saved, that's a bonus. That's amazing. But the most important thing, folks, is the salvation of the lost. Healing the sick Wonderful. Words of wisdom and knowledge, wonderful. Prophecy and miracles, wonderful. Exorcism, wonderful. But if, if these miracles do not result, if the end game is not the salvation of a soul, it's just packaging. It's just bubble wrap. It doesn't really mean anything. Because what if those 10,000 people have been healed of all manner of diseases and sicknesses and they live out the rest of their 60, 50, 40, 30, 20 years on earth in perfect health and then when they die, they slip off into an eternity without Christ forever? What was that healing worth? A few years of pleasure? But what if somebody gets saved? What if a spirit or a soul gets regenerated by God and they remain in sickness? <coughs> now, it's not very pleasant for those 40, 30, 20, 10 years left, admittedly. But then they go on into the presence of God for all of eternity and spend all of eternity with him. Now, miracles are amazing. And as a church, I highly encourage them and we should eagerly desire them and seek after God for the spiritual gifts. We, I am all for that. And for those who come along to the prayer meetings, you know that's kind of what I spend 80% of my time praying about. The power of God. But I would rather one soul be saved than 10,000 sick people be healed. How many of you know that? How many of you would agree with me on that? And Jesus is going to this well when he could be healing tens of thousands of people in the Galilee, he goes to this well to discover and find this one sinful woman to share the gospel with her because he wants to see her saved. That's the heart of Jesus. He went out of his way into dangerous territory to save one woman. That's how important she is. That's how important you are. Jesus sent somebody to rescue you by sharing the gospel with you. And he gave you just the right amount of revelation so that you would respond. Whatever it took, maybe it was a healing, maybe it was a word of wisdom, whatever it took, God gave that evangelist that spoke to you just the right amount of revelation so that you would come to know him. Now, when I read this, I see a very clear strategy and a very, very clear plan of Jesus as to how to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus didn't give her a leaflet to an event. He didn't sit down and say, oh, I've been working on this scroll. Look at this leaflet. I drew the picture myself. We've got this event going on in the Galilee. I want to invite you and your family. Come up and join us. He didn't hand out a leaflet. Leaflets are fine. 
But he didn't do that. He didn't give her a, a gospel track. I carved it in stone myself. There you go, you take that, share it around your village. He didn't give her a gospel tract. Do you know what Jesus did? He initiated conversation. And I've been a minister, well, I've been a Christian, I have 25 years, a minister for most of that time in one sort of a ministry or another. And I can, from firsthand experience, I can tell you, leaflets are good, gospel tracts are good, but you cannot beat one-on-one -on -one personal communication if you want to see somebody come to Jesus. And how many of you know that in the last 25 years, virtually nobody has ever brought up the subject of Christ with me? They've never turned around to me and say, Paul, tell me about Jesus. I want to know. If I haven't initiated the conversation, nothing happens and people have never been saved. But the people I have led to Christ over the years... It's been because I have made up my mind, I'm going to sit down with this person or walk into town with this person and I'm going to purposefully somehow share Christ with them. Jesus used a cup of water. How can I reach this woman? I know, a cup. This would be my prop. Woman, give me a drink. That'll start the, that'll start the conversation off. It might be a cup. It might be a lawyer's manual, it could be a chocolate bar, it could be a folder at work, it could be a movie, it could be any number of things, but there's something that initiates that conversation. It says, hey, let's start talking about this. He finds common ground. After finding common ground, which was they were both thirsty, it was both hot, he began then to turn the conversation very strategically to eternal life. And this is something that we as the church have to become better at. Strike up the conversation, find common ground, and then turn that conversation to God. We have to purposefully do this because it's not just going to happen naturally. We have to follow Jesus' methodology here. The fourth thing is that Jesus says, go and get your husband for me. She's like, well, I haven't got my husband. What's he doing here? What does Jesus already know about this woman? She's, she's had five husbands. And she's currently living in fornication or adultery. He knows this about her. But how does he know this about her? He has a word of knowledge so he relies upon the power of the spirit it's good to be wise and it's good to be intelligent but it's even better to rely upon the power of the holy spirit when you're encountering people with the gospel next he shares that he is the messiah and he wants to correct the wrong views of religion it's neither on this mountain nor in jerusalem that you're to worship the father for the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, true spiritual worship. In other words, you don't look to the Holy of Holies here and you don't look to the Holy of Holies there because the Shekinah has departed. What you look to is yourself. Because as Amy said earlier on, where does the Holy Spirit reside now? He resides in us. So wherever we are, we carry the spirit of glory with us. If we're on the train, you can worship God there. Do you want to know why? He's in you. If you're on the bus, you can worship God there because he's in you. If you're in a church building, you can worship God there because he's in you. Wherever you go, in your car, in your bath, in your shower, in the cinema, you can worship God anywhere because as Christians, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy of Holies is no longer over there or over there. The Holy of Holies is right here. Amen. This is where God dwells now. So you can worship him because you carry him. You are like the Ark of the Covenant. How many of you know that? Amen. There are angels overshadowing you, overwatching you. The blood of Christ has been sprinkled on you. Inside of you, God has written his law on your heart. 
Aaron's staff that was dead and then came back to life. Do you want to know something? You had a spirit that was dead and has now been resurrected back to life. Amen. And upon you and within you resides the Shekinah glory of Christ. You are like the Ark of the Covenant. Wherever you go, you carry God's presence. Wherever you go, you carry God's blessing because you are a Christian. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Hallelujah. Come on. So we wanted to correct her wrong views of religion. It's not about locality or history. It's about presence. And then he wanted to encourage a living relationship with God. You know, over the years, I've had the opportunity and the privilege of leading um, several of my friends to Christ. And once again, as I've said, it's always been uh, on purpose. It's never just happened by mistake. I've had to make up my mind today. I'm going to talk to them about Jesus. I had this one friend I used to work in an insurance company with and uh, every lunch hour we'd walk into town together. We'd go to HMV, go and get like a sausage roll or a McDonald's. Then we'd go to Debenhams and have a look at the clothes and try on the new aftershaves. And, And we'd pretty much do the same sort of circuit every single day and then we'd come back to the insurance office. But after a while, it began to bug me that, you know, he's he's not turned to Christ. And I've not really been opening my mouth. I've been waiting for him to ask me about my weekend so I can tell him about church. It's never going to happen because he doesn't want to go there. So I thought, well, tough, I'm going to make it go there. So whenever he brought a a conversation or a topic up, I thought, how can I use this to lead it to Christ? So if he brought up clothing, oh, what do you think of this jacket on me? Fantastic. Fantastic. It's a really nice jacket. You know, Jesus said you'll be clothed with power from on high if you follow him. (laughs) Paul, what do you you think of this hamburger? Fantastic. But Jesus said, if you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, then you'll be one with it. You know, whatever it was, I purposefully turned the topic. And I, I I, I know, I knew that I was in danger of losing his friendship. I knew that. But I thought his soul is worth it. His soul is worth it. Wouldn't I rather lose my friendship with him and know when I stand before Jesus, I gave him my best shot than to keep his friendship and then stand before Jesus and watch him slip off into darkness. And I kept this up and sometimes he used to get irate with me. You stop talking about religion. You stop it. Then I'd stop. The next day, ready to go into town again. Yeah, come on then. Off we go. Off to Greg's. You know that sausage roll? Yeah. (laughs) I'll be careful not to go there. Um, But, uh, you know, eventually, guess what happened to him? He got saved. Because as I kept on sowing the word of God into his heart, and as it kept on rubbing him up the wrong way and convicting him and bothering him, eventually the Holy Spirit began to move. God began to water that word. And he saved. And that's happened with several of my friends. But what I want to encourage us as the church here this morning to do is, It's lovely when God gives us divine opportunities and divine encounters, but they're quite few and far between. How many of you would agree with that? Yeah. And Nick is wonderful testimony this morning. She stood up here and said, you know, I get regular opportunities to share my faith. How does she? She opens her mouth. She's chopping away at their hair, probably not paying attention, shorter one side than the other, (laughs) talking about Jesus. Better not go there. I only know that because I've looked at Cratch's hair style. Um... (laughs) But because Nikki opens her mouth, because she initiates conversation, she's able to share her faith. Now, Jesus encourages us all to copy his example. We are the Talmud. That means we're the disciples. He is the rabbi or rabbanai. He is the master. And Jesus said it is enough for the student to be just like their master. In other words, what he's saying, I encourage you to be just like me. And when we're preaching to Jewish people, we do it a certain way. But when we're preaching to Gentiles, we do it this way. We initiate the conversation. We find common ground. We speak about eternal life. We twist that over to eternal life. We rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. What's the Spirit of God saying to us? We share Jesus as the Messiah, the only way to God. There are lots of people today saying, aren't there? All roads lead to God. God's wallop. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, everyone say no one. No one one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the gate. Anybody who tries to get in any other way is a thief, a robber, and a liar. 
He says, I am the good shepherd. Open in the gate, I go on ahead and my sheep know my voice and they follow after me. Nobody comes to the Father apart through Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are, how old you are, where you live in the world, unless Jesus Christ is your saviour, you will not enter the Father's presence. That is so important that we declare that fearlessly, boldly, because we're living in a society that's trying to quench the gospel. It's trying to shut the church up. But no, we say, no, I'm not going to shut up. In fact, I'm going to speak even louder. I'm going to ask God for more boldness, for more strength, for more power. I'm going to share this message more and more and more. And as we do so, you're going to see the power of God move. Because you know what happened to that woman? Jesus said, go and get your husband. I don't have one. He says, well, off you go back to the village. And she goes back to the village. And you know what she does in the village? She tells everyone, I have just met this man who claims to be the Messiah. And he has told me everything I have ever done. That I know. It's like, yeah. Oh, what part of Samaria is he from then? He's a Jew. <laughs> what? There's a Jew in our town and he's claiming to be the Messiah and he's told you everything you've ever done. We've got to see this guy. And so they all come out and they all start talking to Jesus. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know what you did. I know what you did. Oi, you're sick. Come here. Wallop, you're healed. Blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is just sharing the power of God and the gospel with them. And they are so shocked. They say, you've got to stay. You've got to stay another couple of nights. He's like, all right, I'll stay. And the whole town, the whole city comes to Jesus. It's a cup of revival. A whole city was saved because Jesus asked for a little drink. Think of that. How can God use you? Moses had a stick. Elijah had a cloak. A little boy had a few small fish. What do you have in your hand that you can use to lead this city to Jesus Christ? We serve an awesome God.